Well, it started about 12, 13 years ago when I was in New York and I was watching television all the time and all the news from Ireland was like shootings and bombings. And this young kid came on and he was a boxer named Barry McGuigan and he said like, leave the fighting to McGuigan was his catchphrase. So I thought it was kind of innocent and, you know, naive a little bit, but great. Here was a guy in a violent profession saying, stop fighting. That contradiction interested me and then Basically, when the Canary Wharf bombing went off, I thought, you know, oh man, we're going back to this, you know? So in essence, then I wanted to make a story about that and my kind of attitude to bombing, basically, and to boxing. I used a love story to cement the two of them together, a story in which the women are seen to suffer in the war. My daughter, with her brave son, Liam, keeps the house together until our husband Thomas returns. I went to Belfast. I met prisoners' wives, and they were very, very frank and open with me and told me, you know, really their life story, and that was amazing to, you know, you go somewhere like that and you've read about it and you've read about it in the papers and you know all the politics and all that, but the, the human tragedy of it just hits you in the face, you know? And a, a prisoner's wife, she's not chosen to be a prisoner's wife. It's because of something he did, he's in prison. And she's just there, she's stuck there. And she's a political symbol. And there's nothing she can do about it. Danny Flynn's out. Danny comes out of jail and he's going home. This place is his home. He decides to stay there. He's not conscious of the fact he's staying there for, for Maggie. Um, at that stage, as he says to um, Ike at one point in the cafe, he, he says he wants to set the record straight. How old are you? 32. Archie Moore fought for the world title at 42. Cha cha. Setting the record straight for him at that moment means having a few fights, just nice. trying to regain some of the pride and dignity that he's lost over the years. Then the bomb goes off, and I think he feels absolutely bound to remain in that place. What the hell do you think you're doing? This is my home. I think I wanted to make a film about kind of growing up and I had this in the back of my mind that the boxer fought within the rules, you know, and that he wasn't a terrorist, you know what I mean? So that it was like, by terrorist, I mean somebody who fights without rules. In other words, who dehumanizes the opposition to the point where any means necessary will work. And I thought that the boxer was somebody who didn't do that, who kind of stood up for himself in a way, honestly, within the ring. And that was the story I wanted to do. He had a fairly clear idea or the seed of an idea of what Danny might be. I did also, and I suppose we met somewhere in the middle and he underwent various different incarnations during the course of the work. But essentially, he remained um, a man who'd pretty much lost the ability to speak. And that was something that struck us both as interesting. It was kind of like a huge silence at the center, wasn't mm. there, of your character? At the beginning of the story, when you find the two of them, and I'm setting up the gym and just trying to get back into it. It's an entire world and it's a secure world and who knows, the ring may have something comforting in the way that a prison cell has something perversely comforting to someone that's been in there a long time. You know, it's something known and the borderlines are very close to each other and the definitions are clear and all that kind of stuff. So the boxing world in its purity, I suppose, must seem comforting to me after all that time coming back into a society that I'd left 14 years ago, which I'd found deeply confusing as, a, as an adolescent and which is gonna seem even more confusing and threatening, I think, coming out. And, and I think that silence is part of the whole thing as well. It's, um, you know, I'm involved in an activity that doesn't require words. I haven't seen you in 14 years. 
and now you're right next door to me every day. And when I do see you, all I get from you is the odd grunt. Do you not think that's strange? We wear masks to be accepted. Sometimes we don't want to be accepted and keep people distant, so we wear a mask. So often the process is not finding out what's the motivation of the character, which is kind of a driven mentality and a kind of too pragmatic a mentality. It's unmasking the masks that the people wear to find out what's the essence. At the beginning, we, we didn't speak to each other at all because, because we've not, in the film, we've not met for 14 years. We decided, you know, we'd just avoid each other. So like, we'd be on here kind of tiptoeing around, trying not to bump, bump into each other. But, you know, as, as the stories developed, I got to know him a bit better and he's very intense. Let's go. He sparred in total about 300 rounds, 350 rounds. He got his nose busted, he got his eyes blackened, he got his lip fattened, he turned out the next day and sparred again. And, you know, right at the beginning I said, Daniel, you know, it doesn't have to be this tough, you know, we can make it easier on you. He said, no, no. I want to understand what a fighter goes through. I want to, in some way, simulate what it has to be like. I was never a boxer at school. I, mean, I loved sports, but I was not a fighter, and I grew up in a, in a district of London where people scrapped a lot. It was part of the daily routine. There's a lot of scrapping. And I wasn't a scrapper, but my friends were, and so I would get into scrapes mm -hmm. sometimes and was never that great at handling them. And I do remember a particular one where, for some reason, absolutely unknown to me. A kid in the class said, look, um, this was Friday, and he said, um, I'll see you four o'clock Monday in the playground. And I just had the whole weekend to think about that. And I was in a cold sweat about it. I don't know, I was probably only about nine or 10 years old, but I knew that there was no way of avoiding this. I remember the fear of that. And that's the kind of fear that you're dealing with in the ring. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to do with the pain. I remember the fight itself, and it was all over very quickly because he was fairly handy, this mm -hmm. character. And I don't remember anything about physical pain at all, mm -hmm. but there was something about the humiliation of having not overcome one's fear, having been made to be that fearful, and the anger that's engendered by that as well. Mm -hmm. And the fear that you kind of keep rediscovering that you have mm -hmm. to control is almost like a childish fear. It's a childlike fear that doesn't relate in any way to the physical pain that you're going to suffer. Because what you discover, and mm -hmm. it's actually, it's not that bad getting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not. It's you know, kind it's, more corrupt. Than it's you not know. fun. There's no, no one wants particularly, but I, I don't mind it. You okay? Can you continue? What? In fact, mm -hmm. I, I tend to respond quite well to getting mm -hmm. hit every now and then. I worked for a long time with Barry, maybe a year and a half, two years, and for a time before that with one or two other trainers to try and learn some of the craft of boxing and to involve myself as close as I could with the sport of boxing and also with the life of the boxing world. Keep your guard up, darling. He got to the stage where he, he was like a really quality fighter. Beginning, we did all the boxing stuff, and I did a lot of sitting in the third row, kind of going, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> and peeking through doors, you know, kind of just putting my toe into the testosterone zone, and then going away again in a bit, in a bit of a fright. I had to learn how to box for the film, and that was like different, so it was good fun training and all. It's a good laugh. <laughs> We choreographed the fight, and Jim thought we looked too good, so we had to just make it up then as we went along. Because we had it all choreographed really well. It's really rough. <laughs> I get my head killed. Make him have a blood test. If it's clear, and he stays off the junk, he can join. Amateur boxing really does help uh, in Ireland, uh, help the working class people make a life for themselves, help the working class kids, 
it excels in hardened uh, sort of tough areas where there's a lot of unemployment and lack of hope. Um, the boxing clubs are shining bright in these places and, and give these young kids an opportunity to make to, to make a life for themselves. Fuck you right, Harry! Put your gun down, Donny Flynn! Fight me like a man! The never hear you! I coached him. I trained him when he was a child. Destroyed his life. I grew up with these guys and new guys that were associated with clubs and that uh, uh, had friends that died in the club and the guys that were, you know, obviously got, got caught up in the troubles and whatever. This night is dedicated to the members of the Holy Family Boxing Club who've died. Now, all these boys' parents are in the hall tonight, so I'd like you all to observe a minute's silence. This is the heart and dairy in Belfast, and, and you know, you've got guys that can brainwash you and fellas that get you involved in trouble and obviously kids die from it and so that's a fair reflection of, of what happens. Half my fucking life I pissed away and all the good things in it because of that sickly bastard and his dirty little cozy little fucking secret world and all the dirt in it. There was a, a, a powerful and frightening piece I remember in the Irish Times while we were well, we were shooting, it was just before the marching season and during mm. the marching season when, you know, when th there was a big threat of violence erupting. And during the peace process that lasted quite a few months, it seemed as if people finally realized there was another possibility and wouldn't accept going back to anything else. But young kids, they're still frightened mm. of the thing that lives mm. on the other side of the barricade. I do draw from growing up in Ireland, you know, I mean, you're surrounded by the situation. Uh, since, you know, like Kent State University, you know, I suppose people of my age in America would remember, but like Bloody Sunday, there were 13 people killed and that went on for like 10 years, like there was conflicts where then the IRA responded and then the British again, then the Protestants. So you're surrounded by it, you know, and you'd have to be influenced by it. But in a way, we wanted it to end. It's a kind of grown-up story about, like, can this end? And our attitude is, like, we understand the historical reasons that the problem came about, but I think at the end of the 20th century, nearly the 21st century, this kind of violence is kind of like a brain-dead way to try and solve problems. What was always deeply moving to me was that Barry had tremendous respect for the people that he was pitted against. Maybe it's only a gesture and in his case we know it's genuine, in other people it might be less genuine, but when he knocked a guy down, mm -hmm. and he did that often mm -hmm. in his career, he'd be the first person to make sure that they were okay. Yeah. I mean, he went through that devastating experience with young Ali yeah. when a fighter died as a result of a fight that he'd been in and it's unimaginable what he went through psychologically. <laughs> One traumatic time in, in my life in 1982, in the Grosvenor House Hotel in London, I had a tragic boxing match with a, a young guy called Young Ali, or Alimi Mustafa was his name. And he died, and it had a, a um, profound effect on me. And the story had an effect on, on Jim too, and he wanted to tell that story, only he changed the outcome of the fight. And that's a similar story to the third fight and that is, I suppose, the only sort of similarity. The difference is the ending to Jim's fight is, is, is brilliant. Box on! It's over. Box on! The fight's over. And what you take on when you begin working on something is the responsibility of telling a story. Mm -hmm. And, you, and, and, and essentially you're telling a story that you don't, you really don't know what the outcome of that 